Hey, what's going on, Mega Ran? Are you ready to help me review the Urban Wrestling Federation? No doubt, Brian. I've been watching all this UWF stuff you sent me. It's insane. Absolutely. And hey, thank you so much for being on board with this one, Ran. I mean, you're so well versed in the world of hip hop, and I know nothing about most of the rappers on this show. So it's going to be great to have your expertise on hand. And uh, just so we're clear, you're not having me on for any other reason, right? Nope. What other reasons would there be? <laughs> okay, 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 just checking, just checking. Of course, of course. Whew, that was a close one. He almost had me there. Still can hear you, Brian. Hmm? I think I've finally blocked enough of Herb Abrams' Universal Wrestling Federation from my mind to focus on another UWF from the past, the Urban Wrestling Federation. Yo boss, check it. This Urban Wrestling Federation thing? Yo, this is where it's at. This one got its start in 2011 and has become somewhat of a cult classic since it came and went. They taped a bunch of matches across three different shows in New York, distributed those shows on pay-per-view, and shopped it around with the hopes of a TV deal. The story was, you had different crews of wrestlers led by a bunch of different hip-hop artists from all over coming to New York to settle their beefs in the wrestling ring. A legitimate cover for some CD action behind the scenes. The UWF was basically sold as Def Jam Vendetta meets The Wire. Ain't nothing like it ever been done before, except in the video games. Urban Wrestling Federation is giving to you something that you can never imagine, my boy boy. Def Jam Vendetta in reality. Well, hey, I'm intrigued. I love the Def Jam games, especially Fight for New York. Oh, for sure. Those games were great. Except for Icon, though. Right. Icon sucked. Icon sucked. Icon fucking sucked. Before the whole UWF catalog recently showed up on Pluto TV, you can find it on pay-per-view, their DVDs, and on their YouTube channel. Since moving to Pluto, the company has taken down their YouTube content, but they still sell a handful of DVDs. For the purpose of this review, we're just going to look at the ones that are available at this moment. First Blood, Bloody Bullet, Gunplay, Street Boss, and Due Time. Hey, were you ever able to figure out what order we're supposed to watch these in? Honestly, not 100%, no. Our story begins with former ECW general manager Steve Carroll, also known as Steve the Hustler, now running his own company, Stonecutter Media Limited. Wait a minute, Stonecutter? That, that name sounds familiar. Who controls the British pound? Who keeps the metric system No, down? no, not that. Seriously, though, where have I heard that name before? No, here? <sighs> Ugh, God. God, I feel so filthy all of a sudden. Believing that there was a market for a wrestling show wrapped in a gritty urban drama, Carol reached out to his contacts in the wrestling and hip-hop worlds to bring the UWF to life. But he didn't do it alone, as he hired two writers slash producers to help put the whole thing together. There was Kevin Kleinrock, a co-founder of XPW and the man behind Wrestling Society X, and Steve O'Neill, former writer for WEW and the eventual head of Extreme Rising, but that's a whole other ball of wax. Hey Steve, I'm still waiting on my refund, man. What's up? I'm pretty sure the first DVD in this collection is meant to be First Blood. I mean, the word is in the title, but for all intents and purposes, you can throw that one away and just watch Bloody Bullet instead, as it contains most of what we saw in First Blood, but with a lot better editing. But there's one thing they kept in both versions, and that's one-sided phone calls. What? What happened? Yo, that's kind of crazy, because you know, well, then let me know what you want me to do. <laughs> Fascinating. You meet a lot of the big players at the start. Uncle Murder, Big Block, and Red Cafe. And as the show goes on, you meet other artists like Cuban Link, the Triple C's, DJ Self, Billy Blue, and Briscoe. Oh, Briscoe. I know that name. Briscoe. Are we talking Mark, J, or Wes? Man, you better be glad we're not in the same room right now. So they have all these rappers on there, but you know they're not going to wrestle. Except for that time Melly Mel threw some badass clotheslines on the first show. So that means... We get a lot of vignettes of the rappers talking with their crews. Smoke them. If Great Cash Day with them, smoke them too. I've been doing this shit for a long motherfucking time. And ain't nobody never take a penny from me then. Ain't nobody gonna take a penny from us now. This is what I need from y'all. 
meeting you, you know what I mean? These scenes are all over the DVDs and there are so many new faces showing up in each one of them, it's kinda hard to keep track of what's actually going on or who's on which team. And sometimes the video is so dark, you have no idea who's doing what to whom. Some of these scenes play into what happens in the ring later, but a lot of it just feels like padding. Oh damn, never mind. Yeah, how about that? There are actually scenes with gunfire in this wrestling show. I guess I shouldn't be too surprised. I mean, one of the DVDs is literally called Gunplay. Almost all these rapper promos end with them and their crew saying, let's get that money, which is odd because you rarely see any money actually change hands. But speaking of money though, look what went into this production. Not only did they get all the rappers and wrestlers for this, everything looks really good on screen. They've got nice cameras and lighting. They've got a crane cam. They ran their first show at the Hammerstein Ballroom. That ain't cheap. That's a union building. Well, now I feel even worse about how light the crowd is for this because they definitely didn't make their money back at the gate. The show begins with a match, if you want to call it that, between Low Life Louie and Murder One. If you don't like the deathmatch style, even as brief as this one is, it's pretty hard to watch. Right there, right there. Murder One over the head again. With a steel chair. Oh, he got buck 50. He made the buck 50. Stabbing him right in the head. Special Federation. This is some of the craziest shit you will ever see in your life. Right now, get it in the head. After that mess, Murder One brings out the rest of the big block crew rep in Atlanta, like Ruckus and the Grim Reefer, which is my pick for the best name in this whole damn show. Then we get Uncle Murder and the Dirty Rotten Scoundrels, Briscoe and the Ghetto Mafia. Oh, snap, Atlas Security in the house. I mean, would you expect anyone else? Let's get one thing out of the way right now. Most of the in-ring action on this show is awesome. Except for that bloody brawl at the beginning, most of the matches are fast-paced and exciting, featuring some pretty good names. Lots of notable indie guys and early Ring of Honor folk, including Homicide, Eddie Kingston, Bestia 666, Ricky Reyes, Famous B, the SATs, and Facade. They even had former WWE CW star Ricky Ortiz, who comes off a whole lot better in this company than he ever did with his rally towel in WWE. So in terms of wrestling quality, you won't get many complaints from us. Yo, they even have a young Willie Mack and Scorpio Sky on here. How dope is that? They're two of the only guys on this show who actually wrestle in their gear. <laughs> Gotta love how Willie's always ready though. Of course, it wasn't just the rappers who got to talk, as there were some honest-to-goodness wrestler promos in there too. And in case you were wondering, yes, Eddie Kingston was great back then as well. I'm tired of rubber bands, tired of dirty jeans, dirty sneakers. I want money, and with that title comes money. They will know that Eddie Kingston does not so. And then there's the announced team, Sean Creedle, Robbie Moreno, and Julia Smokes. I really like the commentary on these shows. They know their stuff, and they kept the action going. There's a lot of calls here that you definitely don't hear on your everyday commentary. He threw him down like a sack of shit. You might want to hit him again. Yeah, you might not want to he take He sits on the chair most of the time and eat all day. You think a chair gonna hurt him? I believe he just told Melly Mata to suck his dick. <laughs> That's the sound of my Beretta, my boy, boy. Referee Edwards with a slow count. You can tell he's a product of the Maryland school system. What? No, no way. Sloppy Joe landed. Sandwich. What the hell? hell no. The first set of tapings saw a tournament to crown the first ever UWF Street King champion. But for whatever reason, the Street King pay-per-view where the finals take place isn't on DVD. Nope, to find out what happens, you have to jump ahead to gunplay or do time, since both DVDs start the exact same way, and get a recap of the four-way for the belt, which was won by Rashi Brown. Rashi Brown? Why not someone like Eddie Kingston or Homicide? I don't think a lot of people are going to know who he is. No disrespect. Yeah, I was definitely confused by that as well. Now, Brown cut his teeth in the late 90s and early 2000s. He worked for Ring of Honor for a while, got some looks from WWE, and even won the NWA World Tag Titles in 2008. It seems that instead of going with a higher profile name like Homicide or Kington as the first champion, the folks in charge decided to go with Brown instead and have one of the bigger names chase after the title. Not that any of that mattered because they killed Rashi off on the next pay-per-view. What? Oh yeah, so fun story. It turns out that between the first and second tapings, Brown and the showrunners came to a bit of an impasse. Not only did Brown allegedly ask for more money, he also wanted to be exempt from having to wear street attire when he wrestled. But the tipping point may have been an interview Brown did with PW Insider after that first taping, where he revealed that he was actively suffering from post-concussion symptoms, including during the show itself. The folks in charge of UWF saw that as a red flag and decided to end further contract talks with him. 
for his safety or theirs? You decide. When Brown left the UWF, he wasn't done taking shots at them. In a statement on Facebook, he doubled down on his stance regarding the dress code, and he also took issue with the fact that the show, which had a predominantly black roster, was written and produced by two white guys. But it wasn't just Brown who had a problem with it, as Homicide had also openly criticized his lack of representation. And while they raised a good point, the writers have said they did give talent the freedom to perform their scenes using their own words. So ultimately, Brown was kicked off the show, and his character, or rather a stand-in whose face you never saw, was killed in cold blood. Damn, UWF went hard. I could see where Lucha Underground got some of their ideas. Oh my God. That's it. What? The UWF was basically an urban version of Lucha Underground before Lucha Underground. The whole thing was about underground fights, illegal activity, killing off characters and all kinds of stuff like that. There are even guys who worked for both companies. The more I think about it, there are a lot of parallels between that and the UWF. Damn, you have a point there. I think somebody owes Steve Carroll some royalties. Anyway, the UWF had some contingencies after Brown's departure, filming a scene of the belt being handed off to someone. Early plans indicated that Rick Ross was going to come onto the show, and those other hands were supposed to be his, but those plans fell through. Instead, Ross's Triple C's group showed up in his place, claiming the belt for their own and giving it to Baby Slim, though he was never officially recognized as champion. But Slim wasn't the only new face in the UWF. A lot of new folks had to be introduced at the next taping at Club Amnesia because a lot of wrestlers from the first tapings had left. I know, right? Homicide, Kingston, Reyes, all their biggest names, gone. What happened? Well, they all left for different reasons. Some of the wrestlers had a problem with the exclusivity clause in their contract and wanted to get out to pursue better deals. Others didn't like having to share the spotlight with the rappers who were getting paid despite not putting any work in the ring. The wrestlers who stayed on were all great, of course, but with some of the bigger names missing after the Hammerstein show, it felt like something was missing. So what happened, Brian? They just taped their pay-per-views and that was it? Pretty much, yeah. They filmed and produced the pay-per-views they had agreed to make, but they didn't sell as well as they had hoped, and TV networks didn't want to pick it up, and that's where the Urban Wrestling Federation effectively ended. But unlike so many other dead feds I've talked about, the UWF didn't die due to bad booking or poor ticket sales or administrative failures. In fact, it technically never went away. Stonecutter made money off the pay-per-views for years afterward, their domain name is still active, and of course, the series has been given a new life thanks to Pluto TV. But to me, its biggest stumbling block was there just wasn't an audience for it. Hardcore wrestling fans weren't interested in stories about gang wars and gun violence and drug deals gone bad, and hardcore hip-hop fans didn't care about pro wrestling. It was kind of hard for me to really get what was going on when watching these pay-per-views, and there were so many characters that after a while I just began to zone out, but at least the wrestling itself was great. They had internal problems like every other company in history, but nothing too egregious and nothing that couldn't have been solved with more time. I'm not going to say the UWF was bad, it just wasn't my cup of tea. See, Brian, that's where you and I differ. It might have something to do with the fact that I've loved and been involved with hip-hop for like my entire life, and the last rap album you bought was... John Cena's album? But I love the whole package. Hip hop and wrestling have had a strange relationship forever. But watching this was like a trip through the 90s. Ultra violent, super hardcore, extra raunchy. This is what us Philly kids all imagined New York City was like during this time. Yo, they took the most hotly contested storyline in hip hop history, regional turf wars, built the whole show around it. New York versus LA versus Atlanta versus Miami, throwing in money, women, violence. Classic formula. The action was great and the presentation was there and I love who they got from the rap world to be a part of it. I just don't think the business was ready for it. Hip hop turf battles have done well in video games, but it hadn't worked in wrestling before. I mean, come on, a lot of us still remember how the gang wars turned out in WWF. Dig it, if this came out seven or eight years after it did, we might be telling a very different story about the UWF. But instead, we just sing the sad, sad song of how it lived so fast and died so young. Like baggy jeans and 6X t-shirts did. So folks, have you seen what the UWF has to offer? Do you think it could work if they try it again today? Let me know in the comments section below. I'm Brian Zane, I'll see you next time, and that's season 10, folks. Mega Ran, take us home. Hey, let's do it for the content. Mega Ran, grab your spray bottles. Let's go. Let's get it. Dick Kick City.
It gets gritty when Mega Ran come through. The kid gets busy. Work yourself into a shoot, but you know it's legit. Like what you like, just don't be a dick. Hey, that's the wet regret. Let's get it. Win, lose, the draw. The kid gloves are off. Mask on like Big Hoss McGraw. The influencer, Zane ain't kicking. Chef cooking it up in the k Fab kitchen. That's the wet regret. Let's get it. Yeah. What's that set? Maybe you should bottle it. Drink it and spray it on. Get Claude to model it. Eight years in, can't look back. Who else can make the lost sweatsuits look whack? Cause they with regret. Let's get it. Yeah. No nonsense of wrestling godsend. You just hating like old man Tronson. Listen, you have never been a threat. You are messing with the best when we wrestle with regret. That's the wet regret. Let's get it. Yeah. Yeah. What up, Zane? It's Mega Rand. <laughs> 